All right. So it's it's great to be back with you and to be able to start the third lecture in, in a lecture series that we're in the midst of trying to examine how political parties work and in particular to look at that question from the perspective of democratic theory. And this will be, I guess, the, the second to last lecture in which I'm taking a historical perspective, looking at in particular how political parties developed and what people thought about them as they were coming into being in the beginning of the democratic tradition uh, in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries. And, and, and having spent some time in the 18th century, we're now gonna move into the early 20th century. So we're slowly getting up to present day. And you, you may uh, recognize or may not recognize Max Weber. I doubt you would recognize Robert Michels, so though he's, he's one of the most important theorists of uh, political parties, his uh, idea of the iron law of oligarchy, sometimes represented as power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, is of course well known. And then Joseph Schumpeter, uh, a theorist of economics, but also of politics, uh, best known perhaps for his idea that capitalism is, quote, uh, creative destruction, uh, that, that, that these thinkers who, who uh, write Weber and Michels are German, Schumpeter is Austrian, um, <clears throat> at the, the beginning of the 20th century really inaugurated a realist tradition in sociology. And they spent a lot of time thinking about political parties, democracy, politics. And, and, and so I want to give them some time today. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start by just going back for a moment and reprising what we looked at over the first couple lectures. And those are the views. And, and I think the big contrast here is Rousseau and Madison. And so I want to present, in a sense, a debate between Rousseau and Madison. And neither one of them likes factions or parties terribly much, but they come to quite opposite conclusions. Rousseau seems to think that when you have a basic partisan split in your society, two parties competing, democracy is over. Uh, Madison believes that although partisan division is not great for democracy, it cannot be eliminated, and the effort to eliminate it is more destructive than the parties themselves, and that therefore you have to design your institutions to not only accommodate, but to channel and put to good use partisan competition, right? And, and so let me, having given you that overview, uh, refresh your memory about the details, right? So Rousseau offers an account of the connection between democracy and legitimacy that I think of as really furnishing the heart of the modern democratic tradition. And he says that political legitimacy for us to not just feel that we're forced to obey the law, but that we have a duty or an obligation to obey the law, that that requires that all persons who are affected by the law, who, who are governed by the law, exercise political power uh, and be able to regard the will that directs that power as a will they have co-authored, right? And, and, and when he says co-authored, he doesn't mean that it necessarily reflects all of your ideas, but that you have sufficiently participated in its construction uh, so that it remains in a meaningful sense your will. And that this in turn requires that you be equally included in the process of forming that will and that the law applies equally to all, right? And, and, and so democracy, for 
you who are governed by the law to be able to own the law as your own law, as if it were just a moral principle that you had made up your mind that you were going to follow, you have to be able to say to yourself, I had fair and equal influence over the way in which the law was shaped. That requires additionally a common good orientation to politics, right? And, and, and here I think to get at the core Rousseauian idea, it is that if everybody is looking out after everybody else's good, then whatever differences we have can be reasonably accepted, right? It, it, it's okay if, if you think that we should drive at 55 and I think I should, we should drive at 65, as long as we're both framing the question in the same way, what's good for all of us? And then and, and we can accept good faith disagreement about that question, what is the common good, so long as everybody is in good faith pursuing it. Right, and, and, and that's in part then why we can consent to laws that we may not fully agree with or that we may even sharply disagree with as nevertheless reflecting our own will if we had a fair crack at actually influencing the content of the law. And if we also um, were we think adequately included in the ideas that ultimately shape the law. They paid attention to our good. He says, when these conditions are met, everyone has a good reason to accept the collective will as their own, even when they disagree with the content. And, and so that's a critical proviso. He then suggests that Rousseau, when factions or parties develop, they pursue their own good in place of the common good. And, and this is a generalization, right? It's, it's, it's a generalization for which Rousseau owes us an explanation. He seems to think that this is in the nature of will formation. When you're in a group, whatever that group is, you pay attention to the good of that group when trying to form the corporate will for that group. And if that group is a subgroup of the overall population, then you end up paying attention to that group's good and neglecting the broader good of society. And of course, that the broader good of society be paid attention to is a prerequisite for democratic legitimacy. And, and so uh, that is the, the idea Right, and, and he suggests in particular, if society splits into a two-party system, then you're really in trouble because the party that wins is going to have no reason to pay attention to the party that lost. Now, James Madison in Federalist 10, as we looked at last week, has a rejoinder to this, has a reply. And his reply is, first of all, as I've said, that trying to eliminate parties involves violating political freedom. People have a right to associate, a right to form groups, and a core political right is to form associations to pursue political ends or goods, right? And, and if you took that away from democracy, then you would, in a sense, no longer have political freedom. And, and so he suggests that the remedy is worse than the disease if you actually try legally to eliminate parties. So rather than doing that, Madison says, we need to create institutions that minimize the destructive tendency of political parties and may actually harness their competition for the common good. And, and so his first suggestion is Rousseau's not wrong, but Rousseau's thinking of a particular kind of polity. And it's not, frankly, a very realistic polity for, very, for, for a modern society. We will almost by default have large associations. The population is bigger, the competition is harsher, the economies are larger. We need to have territorially and population-wise large polities. And this is actually advantageous because 
you know, large polity can only be organized as a representative democracy. It can't be participatory. And it's going to have many cross-cutting forms of political competition. Some people are going to be rich. Some people are going to be poor. Some people are going to be Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, right? He didn't actually have all of that in mind, but we, we can bring him up to, to date. Some people are going to have regional affiliations to the West or the South or the North or the East, right? Uh, some people are going to have philosophical principles that they want to pursue in politics, et cetera. And, and the result of having a large uh, federated republic, right? A republic in which some of the political action is directed into the local level, the state level, the national government, is that you will encourage this constant kind of churn in which I ally with you on certain issues and then disagree and pursue an alternative alliance with others on other issues as a, and, and, and end up opposed to you on those issues. And, and Madison says, so long as we have that kind of uh, democratic fluidity, we don't have to worry about there being a single dominant majority faction. And, and he continues, not only that, but in these conditions, the parties and the leaders they select will not try to replace the public's will with their own, but instead will have to do the hard work of competing to assemble a viable electoral coalition. And that will mean listening to the public, first off, right, of hearing their ideas, seeing what kind of compromise might allow them to put together a uh, winning electoral coalition. But it also means that they will have to enlarge public opinion and refine public opinion to, to put together ideas that don't just appeal to this group or that group, but appeal to a significant portion of the population as a whole. And that the result will be that the will that the leaders of parties pursue will be more consonant with the public good than the public's original opinion about what is in its good. And, and so to be clear, right, Madison is not rejecting the idea that Rousseau endorses, that, that we have to be able to own the ideas and the laws that govern us as if we had contributed to them, but suggesting that that condition is better met when political parties help us to structure our opinions, our ideas, our policy proposals. And so uh, I, I want now to just introduce the idea of a Madisonian political party. And, and this is a political party that does that work, that, that listens to the public, that seeks to find inclusive ideas about the public good that allows it to assemble a coalition that in so doing may refine and enlarge individuals' views, may even at points push back and say that's unrealistic or that's unfair and lacks for inclusion or equal application. The political parties in this sense are a kind of two-way valve that take the good ideas of democracy and amplify and develop them and take the bad ideas and push back against them and say, you can't pursue those and have any chance of winning. Now, the question is, right, is Rousseau or is Madison right? And I'll just pause for a moment and suggest I think that that's probably not a question that gets a singular answer. Right, and this helps us to set the agenda for the rest of this course. If there's not one right answer, political parties always do good work in helping the public to form broad co coalitions and identify inclusive goals for public policy. Or po political parties are not always 
exclusive and interested only in imposing their will, then under what conditions do we tend to get more Rousseauian factions or more Madisonian political parties? That, that's, I think, one question we can take away from the 18th century debate. Now let us get into the 20th century views. And you will see we are, we are uh, transitioning between diametrically opposed perspectives, not only um, in terms of the view of parties, but also methodologically, right? And, and, and so Max Weber, who I'm gonna start with, and I'll, I'll mix some Robert Michels and some uh, Joseph Schumpeter in along the way, these are sociological realists. And as such, they do not believe that Rousseau's idea of democracy works or that Madison's idea of democracy works. They think of democracy primarily as a elite struggle for dominance and political parties as mechanisms for securing the consent of the governed to those who govern them, right? And, and, and so one way to put this is that for both Rousseau and Madison, democracy should be bottom up. For Rousseau, it should be unmediated, just the people themselves determine their will. For Madison, it should be mediated by political parties. For Weber and company, democracy is top down, not bottom up. So let's start with Weber's account of the distinctiveness of mass democracy in the context of modern society. And, and I, I assume, maybe I shouldn't, that, that you're familiar with Max Weber, but Max Weber is uh, widely regarded as either the founder or one of two founders of modern sociology. The other would be Emil Durkheim. He's German. He uh, lived in the late 19th and the early 20th century. He's actually one of the architects of the Weimar Constitution. He was a towering figure in the German Academy, probably best known for his work, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, which argued in essence that Marxism and other uh, traditional accounts of political economy failed to detect what was most distinctive about modern capitalism, and that is the way in which people work. And that in particular, in most previous societies, people were what Weber called economic traditionalists, which means they worked in order to get enough to sustain the standard of living that they were accustomed to. And if you could do that in two days, you would stop working for the rest of the week, right? People were not oriented to profit, to maximizing income. And that what capitalism requires is in fact a very distinctive orientation to economic activity. And that that orientation did not come from within the economy. It actually came from outside the economy, from the Reformation, and from the way in which a Protestant understanding of the need to distinguish oneself in the world, in one's vocation or calling, was necessary to be saved or to prove that one's soul was saved and that one was going to heaven. And that this is what leads to the Sabbathless pursuit of profit that is characteristic of a modern economy. All right, so that, that, that's a little bit about, about Weber. Uh, let me get into his account now of mass democracy in modern society. And the first thing to note is that Weber is much more reconciled to the size and scope of modern society. And, and the, the first metric of measurement is population, that we are talking about societies that measure their citizens in the tens or hundreds of millions, if not perhaps today in the billions. And that 
when you have a population that large, the idea of them simultaneously participating in politics contracts to voting, right? That's the only possible mechanism for simultaneous input. The idea that people could debate, discuss, get together, listen to each other, that is an artifact of a much older and smaller world. Similarly, Weber suggests that we live in territorially large entities, right? That, that we're talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands square miles or kilometers. We're, we're not talking about a place where anybody can walk or drive or fly to all be in the same place at the same time. And so that modern democracy is also mediated, right? And, and, and that means both that we rely on media of communication to structure our deliberations and that we rely on institutions like bureaucracy, and we'll, we'll talk more about this in, in just a moment, to, to coordinate our actions across such a large population and large territories. And, and so the, the next claim here is, is that the vastness of the territory as well as the size of the population requires what Weber calls an administrative state. And he points out that every state has, has had its administration but that up until the modern period, the state administration is not the main locus for the exercise of political authority in many societies. And, and he's thinking especially of pre-modern Europe and the idea that in a feudal society, you rely on uh, others, on the nobility on the lords to administer political power, right? And, and, and so they are not themselves incorporated into the state, certainly not incorporated into the administration in the way in which we think of, about this in a modern society. Whereas in a modern society, we have a bureaucracy. We have officials, right? And, and their role is not that of a, a notable or a, a local lord who, in a sense, gets to decide how power is exercised. They are directly accountable to the central state and required to do only what they are authorized by that state to do. And so they're activity, their, their scope for political activity is strongly circumcised, circumscribed by the structure of the state. And, and that in a sense, we take this for granted. We maybe don't even mainly notice it. And, and Weber felt that in a sense, modern society was a society of organizations. This is true in the economy with large firms as much as it is in the polity with this large administrative apparatus. But the whole, as he put it, texture of modern life is structured to be administered by large centralized agencies. And, and, and these agencies do not allow much room for democratic participation or even democratic input. Third um, aspect of this is the resultant complexity of administrative bureaucracy. And so again, contrasting this with either Rousseau or Madison, Rousseau seems to believe that everybody should be able to come up to speed on every political issue because the political issues faced by a democracy should be relatively simple. Should we collect taxes? If so, how much should we go to war? If so, when and how large an army do we need to raise? Whereas, uh, right, thinking about the complexities of the tax code, we, most of us, probably don't have very specific views on many technical issues, right? So, so what should the rate of depreciation be for farm equipment? on a modern industrial farm, right? How much should that equipment's value be uh, lost or, or counted as lost in, 
each subsequent year following its purchase, right? I don't know. And, and, and it's nothing I've given much thought to. And if I had to figure that out, then there wouldn't be a lot of time to figure all the other things out that might be more important to me politically or to get about my life, right? And, and, and so it's not just that we have administrative states, but that administrative states incorporate expertise that in turn engenders a kind of complexity, a, a kind of technical sophistication and detail to the way in which modern politics is administered that make it hard for ordinary citizens to come up to speed on many of what are in fact important political issues, important exercises of political power. So uh, the, the fourth point here is that mass communication technologies enable indirect, vicarious, and passive forms of political experience. In the polity that Rousseau envisions in the Athenian democracy or the Spartan assembly, you came together to listen to each other. You shouted somebody down, you raised your hand, you were directly participating in the formation of the common will. How do we participate in the formation of public opinion? Well, frankly, what we're doing right now might be about as active as we get, right? And as much as I enjoy these weekly conversations, I don't think that Joe Biden is tuning in, right? And, and, and so we are having a very indirect effect, if, if any effect at all, by having these conversations on how power is exercised. And so for the most part, right, what do we do? Well, it's like rooting for the Warriors. Sorry, Warriors fans, that um, mainly it's a vicarious experience. I, I, I may jump up and down when Steph Curry makes a three at a critical moment and shrug my shoulders when the game goes against them, but, you know, I'm not having impact any meaningful, any real, any direct impact on, on, on what's happening. I'm just living through the actions of others. And Weber points out that this means that our most important forms of political experience are passive. We're, we're watching, we're witnessing. We are not actually participating. And that actually shapes our political orientation and our political knowledge, knowing that we don't have to go to the assembly, that we don't really have to cast a meaningful vote, that we're never gonna have to speak, heaven forbid, means that we can become politically more passive, more lazy, more indifferent, more apathetic. And in fact, if we are rational, if we, if we do a cost benefits calculus, uh, how much Will my reading the newspaper this morning, as opposed to my going and getting the oil change I need, affect my life, right? And, and, and sure, I, I like being up to speed on the events of the world, but I really need that oil change or my car's going to break down. If I don't read the newspaper, eh, you know, the, the, the politics will continue, right, without me. And, and, and so to the extent that there's this concept, which in a sense, Joseph Schumpeter is, is the first to really articulate, though he didn't use the language of rational apathy, right? This is uh, rooted in the very nature of, of modern politics. Uh, and the fifth and final point from Weber is that we live not just in administratively or politically complex societies, but also in culturally complex societies. What's your favorite kind of music? How important is music to you? What is your religion? How important is that religion to you? And in a modern society, unlike pre-modern societies, there's this large menu of choices to make about what we value most in life or how we want to spend our time, what we want to dedicate ourselves. And, and this creates the space 
for and the likelihood of value conflict. And on Weber's view, deep value conflict is not rationally reconcilable. It just is. It's as, as, as he quotes Luther, here I stand, I can do no other, right? And, and, and so he suggests that the modern world has become both atheistic and polytheistic, right? That we have many gods. You may like your jazz. I may like my opera. You may like your Protestant religion. I may like my atheism. And, and so coming together to form views about the common good is going to be much more difficult. It's, it's going to probably be nearly impossible. And Weber suggests that this opens the door for charismatic leadership. The, the fact that we are passive, that we are vicariously involved in politics, but also that we have deep value conflicts and the politics has become so technical and so complex that it's really hard to form good opinions on many of what may turn out to be the most significant issues means that we tend to look to leaders not based on their policy per se or with a strong understanding of what voting for them will mean for us in terms of the laws that will be passed, but instead because they seem to us to create meaning that is consonant with our experience. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's a different mechanism of political choice, Max Weber suggests, a mechanism that puts to bed Rousseau's ideas about owning a shared will. That's really not what we're doing. We're not in the business of constructing a shared will at all. All right, so, so um, I will just remind you that whenever you would like, please do uh, ask a, a question. I did mute everyone because I had the little bit of background noise coming in, uh, but I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm going on. Uh, and, and so if anybody wants to raise a question, comment, just unmute yourself, hit your space bar and fire away. So not hearing anybody firing away. Uh, let me see your faces for 10 seconds. You're all there, are, are, are you, you're with me, I hope. Okay, let, let me get right back to it. Um, I, I, it's just, it's, it, when, when I'm in the slide, it's a, it's a little bit cut off from you guys. Um, I'm now going to get more specific about political parties. And, and both Max Faber and uh, his friend, his student, his collaborator, Robert Michel, uh, and, 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 and Michel's account is, is, is probably the more focused and, and more influential kind of political parties that Weber has a lot to say about this too, focuses on the bureaucratization of political parties. And this gives rise ultimately to Michel's iron law of oligarchy. So uh, to, to begin with, to recap, right, the scale and complexity of modern society makes ours an age of organization and bureaucracy. And, and Weber suggests that bureaucracy is the most efficient way of organizing a human enterprise. He calls it mind embodied. And, and on Weber's understanding, and, and, and this is what influences Michel in, in, in his account of uh, political parties, uh, bureaucracy has the following defining characteristics. First of all, it is uh, defined by the selection of the people who are going to occupy the positions of authority. And they are chosen for their technical competence of filling the role. Oftentimes there's an exam or a degree, degree, degree requirement, and the role is defined to take advantage of the official's expertise and uh, constraint 
so that they don't have to do things that exceed their expertise. This is part of what makes it mind embodied and so efficient, is you are putting people who have technical knowledge in the role to fill, to, 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 to use that technical knowledge to do whatever is required within the organization. So this is very different than from medieval society and feudal political structures, where the firstborn son of whoever the Lord is gets to rule the manor irrespective of whether they've got any talent for it, any ability to, to, to do it well or not. Second big feature bureaucracy for Weber is that it has rationally established hierarchy. That is to say, there are channels of communication, of accountability, of authority that say essentially what your latitude of action is, who you give commands to, who you listen to, how you will be reviewed, and how it is going to be enforced that you will do only that which you have competence to do, only that which you have been ordered or directed to do. And I, I hope you can begin to see why this is uh, correlated on Weber's account with large populations and large territories it becomes very important in large organizations to make sure everybody does what they're supposed to do and only what they're supposed to do. And so the way in which bureaucracy is organized to establish these channels of accountability is also very important. Um, I know this is a little technical, but I, I hope you'll bear with me. The third idea is that there are regular contractual systems of appointment and promotion, right? And so you know that the position is going to be advertised, that the person with the right qualifications is most likely to get it, at least that's the theory of bureaucracy, that you will be reviewed on a regular basis, and that if you succeed according to some objective benchmark or criterion, you will be uh, retained and eventually promoted. Right, and, 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 and so the, not only do you have competent people appointed, accountable to others, but you institutionalize how it is that they're evaluated to make sure that they continue uh, to do what it is they're supposed to do. This means that there will be regular technical training, and Weber also emphasizes fixed salaries as a way of making sure that there isn't corruption or buy-offs and that people don't try to use their appointment in a, a system of clientelism or patronage to, to, to um, enrich themselves by giving favorable treatment to certain people. And so the other thing then that Weber emphasizes is the objectivity, the impartiality, the impersonality of bureaucracy, the rules are what determines what's done, not the personality of the individual occupying the office. Uh, the, the third then big claim here is that bureaucracies have an essential advantage in modern society, that they are the most efficient means of exercising authority. And as a result, you can only fight bureaucracy with bureaucracy. So no matter what ends are pursued, bureaucracy is the necessary means. And I'm gonna give two examples of this, both from Germany. And the first is the example that Robert Michel studied. And, and I'll say just a tiny little bit about him. He is a German social democrat, a Marxist. And, and he works in his early years with uh, labor organizations with unions and eventually the Social Democratic Party, which in Germany in the early 20th century is a party inspired by Karl Marx's ideas. It believes in particular that the proletariat, the, the worker, the average worker needs to be empowered within the political party, that leadership positions should go to the rank and file membership. And then, then it tries over time to select workers who are best qualified or seem to have the natural aptitude for fulfilling important roles within the party. And then it 
um, tries to train them and, and, and cultivate them and pay them so that they can play these roles. And what Michelle notices as, as a participant observer is, is two things. The, the, the first is that as the workers who are recruited into leadership positions in unions or political parties become leaders, they begin to have discrete interests. And their interests uh, uh, cut them off from the ordinary rank and file. They become more like political elites. The second thing he notices is that often these unions and political parties are not able to recruit the most adept officials from the rank and file. And they have to bring in people who have a university education, who come from a more middle class or bourgeois background in order to play this role, right? And, and, and so um, if you want to be effective in organizing the workers, you can't have the workers organize themselves, right? That, that seems to be his central conclusion. And even if the workers do organize themselves, the people who end up playing leadership roles are going to, as a result, be differentiated from, have their situation removed that from, from that of ordinary workers. The, the second example, which is, is not Robert Michel's example, it's an example from the 1980s and 1990s. And this is when the German Green political party uh, became a force to be reckoned with in, in German politics. And the German Greens had read Weber and they'd read Robert Michel and they had made up their minds they were going to resist bureaucratization. And, and they, among other things, said, we're going to have a rule of, of rotating leadership, right? And, and so if you're elected to uh, office, you're only going to serve one or two terms, and then you're going to get out of the way so that we don't have oligarchy, so that we don't have people who consolidate power positions and then become interested in preserving their power rather than doing what we elected them to do, right? And, and that's one of uh, Robert Michel's fundamental observations is once somebody is in power, they will do what they need to do to preserve and maximize their power, even if that contradicts why we elected them. That, that the incentives associated with the office become more important to the office holder than does the representative function of, of being accountable to the membership, the rank and file. And so the Greens tried to directly combat this by creating rotating leadership positions so nobody could consolidate power within the party. The result was that they were ineffective. They were not able to forge the kinds of relationships with fellow parliamentarians or legislators that allowed them to get things done. And of course, they had an agenda that they thought was an extremely urgent agenda. We are doing things to ruin the planet. How could you not want to organize most efficiently to prevent that from happening? And yet their conclusion was, I guess we better bureaucratize. That was their reluctant conclusion, but that's ultimately what they did. They allowed for leaders to hold office over multiple terms. They brought on professional staffs. They became more of a traditional political party. And as a result, they were more effective in pursuing their legislative agenda. And you can see this trade-off, right, that, that Michels and Weber were interested in. You, you either are going to remain democratic and ineffective or effective and oligarchic, that, that you can't be both at once. And this then is uh, complemented by the idea 
that within a bureaucratic structure, individuals are relatively powerless. And if what uh, politics requires is some capacity to direct oneself, some autonomy, the very organizational structure of modern politics seems to put everybody in a situation in which they lack autonomy. Either you're on the outside of organizations looking in, and so you're just a spectator who maybe roots for certain outcomes or is inspired when the organization is taken over by a charismatic leader, or you're on the inside, but then your scope of action is strongly circumscribed, circumscribed by the rules the role that you play, you depart from those rules, that role, you are gonna very quickly find yourself on the outs fired, right? And, and so the social consequence of what Weber calls bureaucratic domination, which, which he thinks of as being one of the central political features of European modernity, is on the one hand level. As, as opposed to a society of hierarchy and notables in which some people have room for action and others don't, everybody is on the same level. And that level is one that is essentially denied autonomy, denied political freedom in any meaningful sense. That we are also um, almost necessarily plutocratic or oligarchic, right? That, that we have to create our hierarchies and that the people who hold the positions in the hierarchies of power are going to have their own interests, their own incentives. That's going to cut them off from the rest of us. And David? yes. All right. This is awfully academic, but while you still have this slide up, and yeah. I put it up again, the... Uh, um, it seems to me you're kind of lumping oligarchy and bureaucracy together, where to my mind, they're totally opposite. Do you have their defining characteristics of bureaucracy, A, B, C, D, and E? All of those are totally against oligarchy, let alone, and also plutocracy. After all, oligarchy means the same people stay in power all the time, and bureaucracy means rotating offices. I mean, they're, they're different concepts, it seems to me. And, uh, uh, and then second, that um, let's look down that list of uh, A, B, C, D, and E. Does that really sound like any political party that you've ever heard of? Let's say in the United States. I bet the Democrats would love it if the Democratic National Committee worked on that basis, but that's a minor part of the Democratic Party. The whole rest of the Democratic Party has nothing in common with bureaucracy. I th and I think, I think, you know, if you look at Weber, for example, you started off talking about our legitimacy as Rousseau and all talked about it. I mean, Weber nailed that one. He says there are three kinds of legitimacy as to why people should obey government. One is because they always did, that's traditional legitimacy. Another is charismatic because they're taken over, you know, by the magical powers of some leader. And the third is rational legal, which is the one that goes along with bureaucracy. You obey the government because you think the laws were legitimately, you know, we're logically formed and, and people's interests are taken into account. But I mean, that's the insight that he had into politics works. It's not, in my opinion, it isn't, it isn't what, you, what you're talking about here. I'm sorry to make it. No, 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 it's good. And thank you for the question and the comment. And, and so I'll, I'll point out to you, and I think you're absolutely right about Weber on legitimacy, but those are three ideal types, right? And, and, and I, again, it, it's, I don't want to get too academic, and maybe we should go back and forth a little bit on email uh, about this if you'd like, but that, that Weber ultimately concludes that uh, modern society mixes legal, formal, and charismatic legitimacy, right? And, and, and that in a sense that legal, formal, legitimacy on its own becomes what he calls a shell of bondage, right? That, that it strips all meaning out of politics. And, and, and so let me now come back to what I think is, is the most important comment you made, which is, you know, first of all, how do bureaucracy and oligarchy go together? And um, when uh, Robert Michel uses the term oligarchy, I think he's using it as opposed to democracy, right? And, and, and so the, the, the term oligarchy here means for him literally the rule of the few, right? And, and, and so it doesn't really matter as much in this context whether those few 
rotate or not. But again, I think if, if, if we look historically at party competition, it is often the case, and in a sense it has been the case in our lifetimes as well, that political parties may be dominated by uh, a relatively few number of people, whether those people are donors or uh, members of particularly prominent political families or just power brokers, right? And, 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 and so that's, as a, the, the, the sense of oligarchy that's being used here is that when you have political parties, and, and I will readily admit that, that we are in a period of partisan crisis in the United States. And I'm, I'm gonna speak more about this in, in coming lectures, that, that our parties are not the kinds of parties that Weber and Michel have in mind, which are strong, organized, uh, professionalized political parties, right? That, that our political parties have been uh, transformed by popular primaries, by the competition for finance, um, by the decline in loyalty to the party, right? And, 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 and then the need to compete via media for uh, votes. And, and, and so all of those things have, have, have changed the nature of political parties. I'm introducing these ideas because I do think these ideas are important, both in framing what it is we want out of political parties or, or how it is we should evaluate political parties, and because I don't think although they don't necessarily apply particularly well to the United States in the 21st century, I don't think they're irrelevant to analyzing political parties as such. Uh, and and I'm, I'm about to, in the, in the coming lecture, look at literature on political parties in Britain and Germany in the 19th and 20th century. And I do think actually this, this framework will, will help to understand uh, European parties and what makes European parties and political parties in general pro-democratic or anti-democratic institutions that help to shape and sustain democracies or institutions that maybe undermine democracies. The, the perspective of course that we're looking at here suggests that um, uh, political parties are inherently hostile to democracy. And, and ultimately, I'm going to, I think, mainly reject that perspective, but I thought it was important to survey it first. Uh, so, so I'm going to leave it there if that's okay. And, and uh, I, is, where is John? I, there, where, where are you? There you are. Okay. Uh, you want to email me if, if, if you want to sustain the, the conversation? Okay, good. So, and, and we're down to a few minutes. Let me just wrap this up quickly uh, with then talking about Weber's account of, of, of modern mass democracy. Um, and I think I went backwards instead of forwards. Here we go. And, and I'll, I'll talk with you about Weber and also uh, another person strongly influenced by Weber, Joseph Schumpeter. And, on their account, they basically reject the idea that there's anything coherent about modern mass public opinion. Uh, and, and so they claim, first of all, that in a mass society with the kind of technology and bureaucracy that mass society requires, the idea of there being a collective opinion, something that we as the people share, is simply a convenient political myth for leaders to tell us. It has no corresponding reality. We don't actually have any mechanism even for forming it. We don't have sufficient ideas to form the grist of public opinion. We are passive and on the other hand, we exaggerate our influence in politics, our uh, ability to contribute in any way to the way in which we're actually governed. And Weber puts this in a, in a very biting formulation. 
he says that bureaucratically organized political parties, right? So that's the only kind of political party we can have in a modern society. Here he's, he's agreeing with building on Robert Michel's account, uh, bring about what he calls the intellectual proletarianization of the masses. And uh, uh, characteristically Weberian way of, of, of putting this, right? A proletarian on a Marxist account is somebody who has no property, right? They, they, they've been deprived of all ownership of the means of production. And it doesn't mean they don't own the shirt in the back or the house they go home to, but they don't own the tools of their trade. They have to work for somebody else. Well, what Weber is saying about modern politics is that the people have no ideas, right? They, they, they don't have the tools of the trade of politics. They have to simply fall in line with one or another political party. That's where political ideas come from. And, and so political ideas are never bottom up, they're always top down. And there's a, a variety of demonstrations that it's actually technically impossible for people to form public opinion. I'm, I'm not gonna go into those today, but the idea is that our ideas are too uh, in, indefinite, too shifting, lack the specificity and stability necessary for us to actually contribute to the formation of an opinion that could be said to belong to a large number of people. Um, and that this exclusion of the masses from anything but rooting for politics is technically necessary. Uh, and so that modern politics necessarily contracts to kind of rooting for your team, to a kind of sports. And so that the main function of modern democracy is what Weber calls plebiscitory or acclamatory. A plebiscite is a vote where you just go thumbs up, thumbs down. Do I want this team to continue ruling or would I like another team to continue ruling? That's the extent of most people's participation in politics. Do we give our acclaim to this group or that group? And the result is rational apathy. There's really no reason for us to spend a lot of time, rational ignorance as well, a lot of energy, acquiring political knowledge or being invested in political activity. As Schumpeter puts it in his uh, seminal work, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, the typical citizen drops down to a lower level of mental performance as soon as he enters the political field. He argues and analyzes in a way which he would readily recognize as infantile within the sphere of his real interests. He becomes primitive again. So uh, on that note, why don't I open it up for discussion? Uh, and uh, who, wants, who wants to start us off? Ho hopefully not in an entirely technical direction. Do you buy the idea from Weber and Michel and Schumpeter that essentially we are put in the stands to, to just root for one side or another? Or do you think that we uh, the people have some meaningful way to actually participate in and influence politics, right? That would be the big question. Madison and Rousseau on one side, Weber, Michel Schumpeter on the other about modern political parties. Do they serve to uh, incorporate, structure, amplify our views? Or instead, do they serve to marginalize us, give all the power to professionals and activists within the party. Bob, go ahead. I can't disagree with uh, all the power is vested in the leaders of the various political factions. Uh, however, there is a, a great emphasis on polling these days. And so in particular, Biden's plans uh, for this, that, and the other thing poll very, very well, and yet the politics are aligned against him largely through self-interest. Yeah, so, so uh, that, I, I think you might have undercut the, if I, if I heard you correctly, you were saying, well, maybe polling is one way in which we're involved, 
right? You know, that, 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 yeah. that if the politicians are trying to figure out what the thing they can do is that, that gets them elected, right? And, and then maybe we're back to a more Madisonian idea, although I think Madison had something more active than polling in mind, right? You know, that, sure. that, right? <laughs> but, but at least that's a mechanism of incorporation. And yet, you know, Biden's plans for uh, the economy approve at 70, 80 percent, right? The, the, the appro approval rating for his stimulus measures and almost no Republican is voting for them, right? And, and so um, it, 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 they actually get many of them, 50 percent or more support from Republicans. So um, I think part of, of, of what you're seeing is that polling is being used strategically, and you might say manipulatively. I think that's what Weber and Schumpeter would say, right? Which is, is to say the reason that, that they're conducting polls is not because they want to listen to you, not because they want you to tell them what to do, but yeah. because they need to figure out how to push your buttons, right? How, how to get you animated, angry, scared, enthusiastic whatever it is right and that this is just a, a a more sophisticated way of putting you in the stands rooting for your side right uh and and you know the 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 nba just went to play in right so so that the warriors rather than having the eighth seed and you know getting into the playoffs had to play a couple games and lo and behold they lost them why did the nba do that because they thought it was going to make things more exciting more people were going to watch and root and i think weber and company would say that's what's going on with polling also that they're not trying to listen to us to figure out what we want they're trying to mobilize us and they need some information it's marketing research it's not public opinion formation okay i can't disagree with any of that yeah sorry i mean and and, and look i'm I, I, as in a sense i was saying to john earlier i'm not coming down exclusively on this side i'm trying to get and let me put it this way so, so you understand that the kind of academic uh, detour that we're taking into 18th and 19th and 20th century theories, I'm trying to get tools in our toolkit so, so we can take up different perspectives. Do parties look like this? Do parties look like that? Or how do they operate? And, and part of the point you'll see, I hope, next week where I'm going is to say it's not that parties are always the same kind of creatures. They vary. They change. And if we don't like parties that use polls merely as marketing tools to figure out how to push our buttons, then what can we do to change the environment such that parties are required to, to behave differently? Um, and and I, I'll, I'll give you much more detail about that next week when we start looking at the, the parties in Germany and England uh, in the transition to democracy in those societies. Anybody else with a, with a question for today? David? Yep. I think you've articulated where we are eloquently. In This isn't a time of anguish. It, it's a time of uncertainty, even misery. But I think right now we are facing what democracy is not, what it might be, what it can be. It's uncomfortable, but it, it's also exciting because we're taking a look at our history and we're taking a look at who we are, what we stand for, for the first time in a long time. Yeah, and thank you for that, Flossie. And, and, and let me just build on that for a second, right? I, I teach 18, 19 year old college students and and some of these kids don't even really remember obama's first election oh, right yeah. they, they, they remember his second election a little bit they, they 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 don't have any memory of kennedy obviously right mm -hmm. and and for them uh what weber says 
sounds absolutely right. And, and the result is that they are completely alienated from politics. And, and, and so one of the reasons to, to conduct this exercise is try to, fig to try to figure out if we're worried that we're losing future generations. And I am worried, I, I'll be direct and honest, I'm really worried that the vast majority of my college students who would have gone into party activism in the past are not at all interested in it today. Uh, what can we do to, to, to make democracy a little bit more attractive? Elizabeth, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, day doesn't go by, but I'm asked to sign 20 petitions online. I don't know whether anybody pays attention to any of them, or, you know, I'm asked to write to my congressperson. I know they pay some attention. It may be um, a slight quirk in what you describe as uh, trying to figure out what will push our buttons, but there are things that push my buttons and I vote, and uh, I hope somebody pays attention. Yeah, and, and thank you, Elizabeth. And, and let me just ask you, and, and you'll have to excuse the directness of the question, after you sign the petition, petition or and and I, I get these solicitations too oftentimes right the the email to the congressperson is already composed for you uh or, or are they asking you to to compose it yourself they ask you to add a little something of your right own. right after after you send it off or sign the petition are you frequently hit with a request for a donation Yes, I've always hit her with a request for a donation. And, and, and this is <laughs> the way in, in, in which, um, uh, frankly, uh, a certain kind of political marketing works these days. It, it's not, and, and I want to be clear about this, it's not as if they don't want you signing the petition. It's not as if the letter sent to your representative has no impact, right? They are keeping tallies on that. Uh, but the organization in question is trying to get you a little bit more committed because the research they're looking at says that the person who signed the petition, the person who sent the email, is much more likely to give a donation than if we just start out asking for the donation. Uh, and that may be, yes. Yeah, so, 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 I am more likely to give a donation. Yeah, and, and, and you know, you, you have... Uh, in a sense, you know, raised your hand, step, step to the front of the line. And these organizations share that information with each other, right? And, and so they know that you've given to this cause and that the people who give to this cause are more likely to also give to that cause. But it's a, oh, so, yeah, yeah and, and, and I guess one of the questions would be, you know, how much of an impact does this have? And, and, and let me be specific, your, signing that petition or writing that note as opposed to you're giving that donation and i'm gonna you know just assign let's say it's the sierra club that is uh reaching out to you and if you sign the petition make the note and give the donation which of those three acts is going to have the largest impact and and if the donation allows the sierra club to hire a lobbyist. And if that lobbyist then goes and uh, frequents the committee where legislation is being designed, uh, you know, which of those actions is going to have the most impact, yeah. right? And the lobbyist can say, well, you know, we've got 50,000 signatures on this petition, so you should take it seriously. Yes, and, and you're, you're absolutely right that in a sense they go together, but if the lobbyist isn't there, right, then the 50,000 signatures or the 500,000 or the 5 million signatures may not do very much. John, did you have your hand up? Go ahead. I do. Um, it seems to me that what the most interesting and in some ways the most significant thing of American politics in the last 20 years or so has been the Tea Party. And that's been, and certainly the Tea Party certainly had some big money help from various uh, kind of counter elites on the right opposed to the dominant American 
uh, way of doing things, but it basically was a grassroots meeting of where people came out and went to meetings and contested uh, primaries and uh, got their guys in. And, um, you know, certainly a challenge to uh, practically everybody that we know and like and was pretty, uh, you know, effective. Yeah, so so I am going to not completely agree with you about it being grassroots. And, and so I think what you said at the beginning and, and, and uh, the people who study this, I would point you in the direction of Theta Scotch Pole, for instance, who's done some good work on this, call this astroturf, right, as opposed to grassroots, right? If grassroots grow up spontaneously, astroturf was manufactured and put down, right? Uh, that the, the, the Tea Party movement wasn't just catalyzed. It was funded. It was given large amounts of, 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 of money. The Koch brothers are the, the most obvious donors here, but they organized uh, a whole group of primarily billionaires to contribute an awful lot of money. Uh, and then they did uh, exactly what you're saying. They used the primary process to challenge traditional Republicans and to replace them with more ideologically extreme candidates in primarily the closing decades of the first decade of, of the 2000s, 2008, 2010, 2012, I guess 2010, 2012, they were doing this and they've changed the Republican Party. The, 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 they've produced the party of Trump as a result, and it might be the most consequential thing that's happened in American politics this century. Um, but I think we shouldn't confuse it with a grassroots movement. It did get people animated, energized, voting, but it was, to my mind at least, uh, another form of manipulative top-down politics that was very well funded to cater to the interests of those who stood a lot to benefit by pushing back on anything but the most minimalist libertarian philosophy of government uh, that, that ended up being the Tea Party's position. It was anti-Obama. It was absolutely anti-Obama. And, and so uh, we'll bring race in soon yeah. enough because it wasn't just anti-Obama because he was the leader of the Democratic Party. It was anti-Obama because he was an African-American president and all that that represented. I do have another, <laughs> I'm sure I've got to give him 15 minutes and I do want to catch my breath. I love talking with you guys. The, the, the give and take is, is the best part of it. Uh, and I'm, I'm loath to, to cut it off, but I think for the sake of my lower back, I had better get going. So great being with you to be continued. Thank you for the good questions at the end. Be well. See you next week. Bye everybody. Thank, Thank you, David. Stay well. Thank you. Thanks. Bye guys.